Part One. You are going to hear a conversation among Dr. Archer, Larry, and Judy, talking about the new term. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. Okay, everybody. Welcome back to the new term. I hope you've all had a good break and that you're keen to start on your research project. What I'd like to do this morning is to give you a chance to ask questions about the project, requirements, ways of approach, how to get help if you need it. Today is informal. It may be already written on paper, but it's nice to have an opportunity to have it confirmed. So, any questions? Dr. Archer, is there a confirmed due date yet to hand it in? Yes, I can now confirm that it's 16th of July, not 15th, as first advised. Okay? And what about the word limit? Well, there is some flexibility on this, but in general, it's eight to ten thousand words. Ah, I see. And you can choose your topic, anything from years two and three. Yes. I still can't work out what I want to do it on. Who um. In that case, you should see your course tutor to agree on your final topic, and you should also be aware that there is special assistance available at the library on library resources if you need help on that. Can I just check on the deadlines for everything? Certainly. Look, let me write it on the board when each stage should be completed. First of all, you've got to work on your basic project outline, and that's due in to your course tutor by twenty-first of February. Which is only two weeks away, so you need to get cracking on that. Do we have to include a full reference list by then too? No, your reference list is due on sixth of April, which is one week later, so you have time to discuss this with your tutor. And when should we be doing the research? Well, that's over a one-month period, essentially April to May. And the write-up? Well. You need to do quite a bit of research before you get going on your writing, so that's really May to July, with the due date for handing in on the sixteenth. Any more questions? Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions seven to ten. Now listen and answer questions seven to ten. Well, sir, just some advice, really. It's about the research approach. Would you advise us to use some case studies? Well, Larry, I know these can be difficult to arrange sometimes, but I really feel they are of great benefit in this subject. You can always talk to your tutor if you're having difficulty. Yes. I've looked over some previous research projects that are in the library. Is that a good idea, sir? I heard. Okay. I don't think you should go through them in detail, especially at this early stage, or you might end up being influenced by them more than you realize. But yes, it really is about the best guide you can have to what's required in the to what's expected in this type of project. Sorry, Judy. I butted in on you. That's all right. It's just that I noticed one project was a joint one. They worked together as a pair. Is that a good idea? Yes, I remember that paper. Working in a pair can have some advantages, but to be frank, this is meant to be an individual project, so it's best to work on your own. About using subjects, is it okay if we use family members? Your own relatives? I don't see why not. They probably offer some advantages in terms of availability. Although you need to guard against possible effects on your research outcomes, so you can if you want. Perhaps you should discuss this with your tutor if you plan to use relatives, so you can approach it in the best way. Okay, okay thanks. thanks. Okay then. Well, I hope we've been able to sort out a few things. You're welcome to see me at any time or drop me a note if you have any more queries. Fine. Fine. Thanks. thanks. That is the end of part one.
You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear three students talking to their tutor about the presentation they are planning. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Good morning, everyone. So, you're going to tell me about your presentation. First of all, what's your topic? Did you say you were going to talk about the uses of mobile phones? Uh, not exactly. We're actually going to explain the dangers of using mobile phones. Ah, OK. That sounds interesting. What are you going to discuss exactly? Well, we've planned to divide the presentation into three sections. We'll have an introduction explaining why we think it's important to understand the dangers of mobiles. Then, on the second slide, we'll have a list of the different types of danger. And then on the last slide, we're going to suggest ways of staying out of danger when you use a mobile. Yes, we want to start by telling the audience that using a mobile phone can be dangerous and then go into more detail in the next part. OK, but before you talk about the dangers of mobiles, I think you should mention the advantages. You could put that in your introduction. It balances up the argument a bit. Oh, yes, I see what you mean. Right, we'll do that. So... Shall we have a look at your presentation? Did you bring it with you? I've got it here on a memory stick. Can we show you on your computer? Yes, that's fine. Let's have a look. Hmm. Right. As you say, you're going to add the advantages of using mobile phones to the first slide. Good. Who's going to explain the second slide with all the dangers? That's me. Do you think I've got enough detail? Yes. I think there's plenty of information, but I think it's all a bit mixed up at the moment. I mean, you've got dangers like getting headaches in the same list as having car accidents and being robbed in the street. They're all different types of danger, aren't they? I think you should divide them into groups, maybe under separate titles like health, accidents... And security. Oh, right. Yes, thank you. That will make it much clearer to the audience. Mm. OK. Now, in the third slide, you can put your suggestions for staying away from each of these dangers under separate titles. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. Have you got any other questions? Um, yes. The presentation should be for 10 minutes. Is that right? Yes, but 10 minutes in total, including 3 minutes for questions. So you'll only talk for 7 minutes. That's only 2 minutes each. We won't be able to say much in that time at all. That's why you have to plan what you're going to say carefully and make sure you only include the most important information. For instance, you won't have time to give examples, 
but you could put some images on your slides that show examples without spending time talking about them. Hey, that's a good idea, and the audience can look at them while we talk. And another thing, make sure all the slides have the same style. You should get together and agree on one style for the whole presentation. Okay, we'll do that too. Thanks a lot for your help. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between two students who will discuss a project they're working on together. You have thirty seconds to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-seven. Hey Jess, glad you could make it. We've got a lot to discuss. Hi Matt. Yes, sorry I'm a bit late. I did bring all my notes with me. Yes, me too. Where shall we start? Well, I think it would be a good idea to clarify our objectives just one more time. Yes, good idea. Okay, here we are. We need to record, photograph, and identify the plant species in ten one square meter plots. Does it say anything about where these plots should be and how they should be laid out? Ah, here it is. It says that all the plots need to be no more than ten meters apart. And how do we choose them? Ah, this is the fun part. I remember this. Here we are. Make a one meter square frame using bamboo sticks available from the department stores. Yes, we've we've already done that. I know. I'm just reading the whole section. Okay. One person stands roughly in the middle of the chosen area and throws the frame. The other person uses a tape to mark out the square where the frame landed and returns frame to thrower. The thrower then turns a few degrees on the spot and throws again. The thrower must turn slightly after each throw and vary the force of the throw until after the tenth throw they are pointing in almost the same direction as the first. That sounds a bit complicated. That's only because it's all in writing. It's just a simple throw, turn, throw, turn, throw, turn until we have ten squares. And I guess you want to do the throwing. Well, if you don't mind, I'm sure you'll be more accurate at marking the squares. Yes, I am sure I am, and I'm sure you've got a stronger throwing arm. You now have thirty seconds to look at questions twenty-eight to thirty. Okay, good. We've got that sorted. Now we need to decide where to go. Yes, I've been thinking about that, and I've brought the map. Ah, well done. I forgot mine. Now I've identified three possible locations, but they've all got some disadvantages. Okay, fire away. Well, the area around this lowland marsh could be interesting. There'll be a lot of interesting water plants here. Looks good, but what's the problem? Mainly that it's already a designated nature reserve, and I think there's already been a lot of research done here. Ah, I see. Well, I'd rather do something that's new and can be useful. I agree. That's why I identified this area further west. See here, behind the beach. Oh yes, I see that area there, where it's flat but quite high. Exactly. If you look a bit further inland, you'll see that there are hills which will protect that area from strong north winds. I see. Excellent. But what's the problem? 
suggests that it may not be very interesting. We know that the geology there is not conducive to a wide variety of plants. Hmm, I agree. So, what's your last idea? Well, I think this one is a bit of a winner. Although I did want to show you the other two. Look up here on the north coast. Where? See this bay? Well, I know that there's been quite a lot of studies done here, but a bit further to the east, behind this headland. No one has ever looked at that. Well, I certainly couldn't see any studies. That is interesting, and the plant life could be a bit different because of the shelter from the wind the headland provides. Exactly. Brilliant, Jessica. That's a great idea. We'll go there. Thanks. Now all we have to decide is when is a good time. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear an environmental studies student giving a presentation about his project on saving an endangered species of plant. Now you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen and answer questions thirty-one to forty. For my presentation, I'm going to summarise what I've found out about efforts to save one plant species, the juniper bush. It once flourished in Britain and throughout the world's temperate zones, but over the last few decades has declined considerably. Before I go on to explain the steps being taken to save it in England, let me start by looking at some background information and why the juniper has been so important in cultural as well as ecological terms, historically and in the present day. Firstly, I want to emphasise the fact that juniper is a very ancient plant. It has been discovered that it was actually amongst the first species of plants to establish itself in Britain in the period following the most recent ice age, and as I say, it has a much valued place in British culture. It was used widely as a fuel during the Middle Ages, because when burnt, the smoke given off is all but invisible, and so any illicit activities involving fire could go on without being detected. For example, cooking game hunted illegally. It also has valuable medicinal properties, particularly during large epidemics. Oils were extracted from the juniper wood and sprayed in the air to try to prevent the spread of infection in hospital wards. And these days, perhaps its most well-known use is in cuisine, cooking, where its berries are a much valued ingredient. Used to flavour a variety of meat dishes and also drinks. Turning now to ecological issues, juniper bushes play an important role in supporting other living things. If juniper bushes are wiped out, this would radically affect many different insect and also fungus species. We simply cannot afford to let this species die out. So why is the juniper plant declining at such a rapid rate? Well, a survey conducted in the north and west of Britain in 2004 to 5 showed that a major problem is the fact that in present-day populations, ratios between the sexes are unbalanced, and without a proper mix of male and female, bushes don't get pollinated. Also, the survey found that in a lot of these populations, the plants are the same age, so this means that bushes grow old and start to die at similar times, leading to swift extinction of whole populations. Now, the charity Plant Life is trying to do something to halt the decline in juniper species. 
It's currently trying out two new major salvage techniques, this time focusing on lowland regions of England. The first thing it's trying is to provide shelters for the seedlings in areas where juniper populations are fairly well established. These, of course, are designed to help protect the plants at their most vulnerable stage. A further measure is that in areas where colonies have all but died out, numbers are being bolstered by the planting of cuttings which have been taken from healthy bushes elsewhere. Now, I hope I've given a clear picture of the problems facing this culturally and ecologically valuable plant and of the measures being taken by plant life to tackle them. If anyone has any questions, I'd be happy... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.